everybody was mailed the minutes. Uh, I will uh, entertain a motion to approve the minutes as they were mailed. So moved. Is there a second? Second. Any corrections or uh, uh, to the minutes as they were mailed? No further discussion. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? All right. Uh, there is no official action today for the board. Uh, this is our uh, our favorite day of the year when we get. <laughs> <laughs> I know it's mine. So. <laughs> this is St. Mark's Day, and, uh, <laughs> and so uh, uh, the. Uh, it, it, honor of the season uh, next year's budget will be resurrected and, uh, <laughs> the, uh, <laughs> um, so I'll recognize Gabe thank you chair um, I'd like to recognize Mark Walker uh, to senior vice president and CFO on the bond refinancing we just recently completed so Mark okay uh, commissioners you will recall back in February we came to the board requesting authorization to refinance uh, $415 million in outstanding bonds for all four systems. Uh, the sale of the refunding bonds has been recently completed. Uh, we did it on two days in late March, and the results were very good um, and actually better than expected. So I'm pleased to be able to share those with you today. Uh, we sold the electric and gas refunding bonds on Wednesday, the 24th of March, and the next day we sold the water and wastewater refunding bonds. And we split that up over two days in order to, I guess, more strategic thinking about maybe you get more bidders and better bids, because it is a large amount of bonds. And so we've done that in the past sometimes when it's large issues, split it up over two days. So that's what we did here. And I think that maybe proved to be successful because we did have a lot of interest, a lot of bidders on the bonds, a lot of good bids on the bonds. I do want to point out that, uh, as you would expect, we're not extending the life of the debt that's being refunded with the new bonds. In fact, it's shortening up a bit, uh, in particular for, for the gas system, and we'll see that here in just a few moments. But now for the really good news. The, the total savings on the refinancing is just under $80 million, and that's for all four systems combined. Um, when we came to the board in February, we were projecting a little over 69 million, so we bested that by over 10 million. So we're very pleased with that. Wastewater is the big winner there with savings of over $47 million. It, it's also important to note, because we'll see it as we go throughout these slides, that uh, how the savings is taking place. It's taking place through principal savings as opposed to interest cost savings. And so when we put the notice the, for the underwriters, the potential bidders, how we wanted them to bid, we were expecting a little bit higher coupon rates or interest rates on the bonds in the four to five percent range and above market. In exchange for that, we were asking for premiums. So these are premium bonds and we received a total of about $80 million in premium. So what do you do with that premium? You would apply it towards paying off the outstanding debt. So the bottom line is we sold 336 million in new bonds to refinance 415 million or pay off 415 million in outstanding bonds. So we reduced our principal by a little over $79 million, which is a big deal. Mark, can you uh, tell those of us who are uninitiated uh, the, uh, that what's the difference between a premium bond and a regular bond? A premium is when the underwriter in exchange for a higher than market interest rate is going to give you cash up front. That's the premium. And then on refinancing, you're required by by the Treasury, you can't just say, oh, I'll keep that money and spend it on something else. No, it has to be applied towards paying off the, the refunding, uh, the bonds you're refunding. So, so we're going to go through each um, set of bids here real quickly, but for the electric bonds, we sold about $70 million in electric refunding bonds. We had 11 bids on the bonds, which is very good. The low cost bid was Jeffries LLC. That's an investment banking house out of New York. And uh, the low cost bid was about just under 1.99%. There we go. And you can see how close that is. That's just a fraction of a basis point. So it's very competitive. Um, but Jeffries LLC was the low cost bid. Now, one thing I want to point out you see the TIC about 1.99%. Well, how do you? How do you calculate that? You have to take into consideration the premium and also the interest rates on the bonds. The interest rates averaged about 4.4%, but the premium was 16.8 million. 
you put all that together in a calculation, it comes out uh, to that. So the electric refinancing, the total savings for electric was $14.3 million. That's total. $16.2 million of that is through reduced principal or principal savings. And so interest cost actually went up about $1.9 million, and it nets out to the $14.3 million. The chart on the right shows just how that savings occurs over the life of the bonds. The difference between the blue and the green means savings, basically, for your information. These bonds will fully mature in July of 2044, but are callable by July of 2032. And that is a key point, because how we structured this with those higher interest rates, you really preserve the opportunity to refinance in the future, albeit it's 10 years out from now. But if we had gone the other way and just not gotten premiums and got nothing but interest rate savings, the opportunity to refinance in the future is essentially probably nil, I would say. So that's electric. Gas, we had 12 bids in total, 42 million, just under 42 million on gas refunding bonds. Low cost bidder, JP Morgan Securities. And the bid was about 1.4, little, little over, little under 1.47% TIC. Um, it's lower than what you saw in electric because the duration of the gas bonds uh, is shorter. These bonds will fully mature in 2033, electric's 2044. So that plays with your, your TIC as well. The average coupon rate on these bonds, 4.4% also, but we received 7.2 million in premium. And on the gas refinancing, total savings, $7.9 million. 7.2 million of that is in principle, $700,000 in lower interest cost. And I did want to note, you can see on the old bonds, those were due to mature fully in March of 2035. We actually moved that up two years, and that's a good thing for uh, for the gas division's debt profile. On water, this is where we received a record number of bids for a KUB bond sale with 13 in total. Uh, again, very competitive. 1.90% true interest cost. The low cost bidder was Piper Sandler. That's an investment banking firm out of headquartered in Minneapolis. Um, the uh, average coupon rates on these bonds, 4.3%. The premium we received, 8.1 million. And the total savings on the water bonds, here we did get some interest cost savings. Uh, the principal savings is $8 million. Interest cost is 2.2 for a total of 10.2. And you can see the majority of that savings is gonna occur in the next 10 to 12 years. These bonds fully mature in March of 2044 are callable by March of 2032. And then finally for wastewater, this is the big one, 191 million in wastewater refunding bonds. The low cost bid was from Barclays Capital, also about 1.90%. Here we even had to take out the digits further to determine the, the winner. You can see how close that was with Bank of America. Um, the average coupon rate on these bonds, 4.27%, but the premium, and it's a big one, $47.1 million. $48.1 million in premium we received. And so wastewater really is the, the great story here, I think. The refinancing saves a total of $47.2 million, but $47.8 million of that in uh, principal payments. And so today, if you ask me how much outstanding wastewater debt do we have, the answer is $524 million. Monday, when the funds flow on all this, it drops to $476 million. And you know we have some debt reduction goals for the wastewater division. We'll talk about that a little bit later today. We're well in advance of, of achieving those goals thanks, thanks to this and thanks to your support in letting us do this refinancing. These bonds fully mature in April of 2049. I know that's a long way out, but they will be callable by April of 2032. Mark, have we ever um, done a, um, a premium refinancing like this one? not to this level of significance. Often, in, in this case, we actually sort of forced the premium and that we made it known to the potential bidders, the underwriters, that we were going to be, we wanted you to bid coupon rates in the four to 5% range. So by doing that, they had really said, okay, well, we're gonna free, give you cash in exchange for the difference in the interest rates. So we really, this is the first time our call is really forcing it. It has happened in the past just by the, the way things go whether it's a refinancing or a new money issue in that regard. Um, but 
here it was we really wanted this to happen. It was more strategic in this case. So if uh, by the by, by you, Mark, and the, and our advisors and putting that together, because that doesn't happen very easily at all. Yeah, a lot of work went into this, and we're really pleased. You know, we have some good partners in this. Cumberland Securities has right. been our financial advisor for a long time now, but they they really you know were all over this and and helped in obviously making this happen. Great. If I understand correctly, the key here is that we could have gone out with a traditional uh, request and gotten a 1.9 or 2 percent uh, interest it. rate. But that is correct. That's so low that we probably wouldn't. 10, 20 years from now, the chances of us being able to refinance that is not great. So this this gets us both cash on the front end and a chance to refinance at a that lower is rate. Correct. Okay, that's you good. Got it. That's that's yeah. pretty terrific. So final slide, just um, uh, disclosing to you the fees that we paid to all of our partners associated with making this uh, sale of this refinancing happen. FA is Cumberland Securities, our bond councils, Bass, Berry, and Sims. And then of course the rating agencies, we use Moody's and Standard & Poor's to, to rate our bonds. The total price tag of that is just under a million dollars at 996,000. That is a bit higher than in the past, but on a per bond issue, par value of bonds, it, it's not, it's competitive. And um, you, you talk about return on investment. Anytime I would spend a million dollars to save $80 million, I'll, I'll take that each and every time. But uh, so anyway, uh, appreciate all your support on this, and we're very pleased with the, with the results. So I'd be happy to answer any questions you might have. Questions for Oh, yes, yes. <laughs> um, we have the, uh, a final official statement on the refunding bonds in this big notebook that Jerry is holding up before you. Uh, we do make that available to any board member that wants to uh, look at it here today or take it home with you, um, which I know John's already grabbed it up. Um, I'm not surprised by that. And then it's also available for viewing by the, any member of the public that's here. And we will be, po we will be posting that on our website later today Very as good. well. So. Thank you. Um, there's no additional action for the board today, but before we adjourn the board meeting and begin the financial workshop, is there any other business or are there comments from the commissioners today? Okay. Are there any members of the public who wish to address the board today? Don't see any. All right. The board meeting is now adjourned and we'll begin the budget workshop. Gabe? <clears throat>
keep our folks safe. And then we focused on our customers. You know, we had to make be careful if we ever went into someone's home, things we had to do a lot differently. And like I said, our folks did an amazing job just adjusting to that and, and helping our customers. And, and this last year was unprecedented. We did things like, you know, it's just been a disconnect for over seven months. We waived all fees. We have seeked out millions of dollars to help our customers pay their bills, and we're continuing to do that. And so we will not give up on what's they're still, you know, to me, the, the, while the light's at the end of the tunnel, we're not there yet. And we have continued to help serve our customers who are struggling to make their ends meet and make sure that we, don't, we, we help them get their utility bills paid off. And through this whole thing, we had award-winning performance this last year. We received 24 awards in 2020 for things we're doing operationally, uh, environmentally, stewardship-wise, community service-wise, a record year for us. And those are all third-party awards that are given to us through different uh, channels. But it speaks to the fact that we didn't, you know, we didn't sit on our laurels, we didn't get, in, get complacent, we kept working on our systems thoroughly. And so I want to speak to that. And then environmental leadership, um, sorry. Um, you know, we continue, to, we get, continue to get recognized for all the things we're doing with Green Invest. And you'll see some additional programs in today's presentation about how we're continuing to, to help move, our, move the needle environmentally in this area and, and leave this place in a better spot than we, when, when we inherited it from our you know, and, uh, people ahead of us. And then lastly, I want to talk about you know, economic challenges. You know, we are continuing to invest in our system. We had to do a lot of things last year to, to adjust, but we are continuing to replace pipes and wires and things like that to keep our system strong. And, and, but we will adjust accordingly as needed to make sure we weather the storm. And so with that being said, let's kick off fiscal year 2022. Uh, we are committed to Century 2. Uh, we have not, you know, wavered from that. We did adjust some things last year to, to, to accommodate the, the COVID crisis, but, but we are continuing to do that. We won't stop doing this. We do a little bit every year in perpetuity to completely, you know, in essence, to keep your system strong. You hear a lot in this country about infrastructure bills and how bad the country is. Well, I will tell you, we're, we're still ahead of that curve and, and continuing to do the things to do to replace our pipes and wires and, in, and infrastructure to make sure it, it works for our customers when they want to use it. Uh, we also want to manage rates. It's very important. You know, last year we, we, we uh, eliminated all rate increases that were planned for all four utilities. And this year you'll see that we are proposing to only have a rate increase in one, a very, very small one. But that's because of things that we're doing like refinancing bonds and wastewater and, and you, plugging those savings back into our systems to help our customers maintain that. So what you hear today are no rate increases for gas, none for electric, none for wastewater because of that refinancing and a small one for water. Now, I will put the caveat that broadband is not in this plan. So if we do decide to go that direction, that will change the electric plan a little bit. But as of, as of today, that we are not asking for any rate increase in the electric division. And we will continue to support our customers. I mentioned earlier on, you know, we are not through this crisis totally. Um, I see things getting better, but we'll never continue helping our customers get their bills paid, help them keep their lights on, their water flowing, utilities flowing. And so uh, our folks in Tiffany's shop and other places are still doing a very good job of, of listening and, and trying to find those dollars to help those folks out while they get back on their feet. So we'll kick off today. Um, we have three speakers. Uh, John Williams will start off with the electric and gas plans for next year. Then Durham will pick it up from there and take the wastewater and water plans in detail, uh, particularly the water plans since we do have a small rate increase. And then Mark will be our closer today on the financials, basically how do we pay for all these things and, and looking a little bit ahead past this year into the future about what we think the, the next even 10 years look like. So with that being said, I'll, let, I'll turn it over to our folks and let John kick it off. So. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, and, and we'll kind of walk through this. So this is intended to be a workshop, so please feel free to ask questions, comment, all those things. Um, I feel really comfortable about that today because of some of the folks back here in the back, um, like Chris Hood and Brian Day, who put all this budget stuff together. So if I can't answer it, which is highly likely, then they can, um, but in all seriousness, a lot of folks went into this today, not only Brian and Chris and his groups, but all the engineering operations folks that kind of helped pull this stuff together. So a lot of good work that went into this. I'll do my best to talk through this um, as quickly as I can, but at the same time, I do want to honor any questions you all have in the process, so please feel free to speak up. Um, I'll start with just a little bit of backdrop. A um, lot of conversations recently in the news and 
about just the state of infrastructure uh, nationally. Um, and, and I think it's important for a couple of reasons. One is that, in addition to being in the news, um, American Society of Safety Engineers recently uh, published a new report. They do this about every three years. Uh, in 2014, the score nationally um, was a D plus. 2017, another D plus. So incrementally, maybe um, a C minus is better than a D plus. Um, but as you can see, the utilities listed up here as well that um, are are certainly right along those those same areas. They also look at bridges and dams and roads and a lot of other national infrastructure. So that's all part of the scorecard. But you can see how the utilities stack up in that. Um, so a lot of, lot of work nationally. Um, and just within this report, one of the kind of the interesting statistics is if you wanted to move that to a, to a B plus, uh, the nation would have to double its spending in infrastructure. That kind of just gives you an idea of the significance around moving that score along the way. Um, so I do think that that Century 2 in our work puts us ahead of the curve, and, and I do want to mention ahead. Um, th this is just a, a look back. February, you'll recall, the, the cold snap that hit the South, unprecedented. We use that word too often these days. Um, but just some accounts in Memphis and in Texas, Shreveport, Louisiana, Jackson, Mississippi, about how they were impacted, those communities were impacted, how the cold impacted their infrastructure that then impacted their folks. So everything from, from boil water alerts that you'll see along those areas. Uh, I thought the mayor in Shreveport really kind of summed it up very nicely when he said uh, old aging infrastructure just like most American cities. Uh, so this is not unique to any one of these communities um, and, and certainly not intended to cast any negative light on these communities. It is a national, a national issue. Um, and with that though, um, you know, one of the unfortunate realities when, when infrastructure fails is those who can go someplace else um, are, are less affected than those who cannot. So seniors, um, those with disabilities, um, those without the financial means to pick up and, and go somewhere else are impacted more. And the and unfortunate story in Jackson, Mississippi, and one of the pictures there just kind of shows what those residents had to endure um, and having to wait over a week to even have access to water uh, and then the means by which they had to collect that. So just a uh, just kind of a deepening understanding of, of the importance of our infrastructure. Um, for, for years, we, we always talked about kind of we want to be taken for granted, right, and, uh, and want people to expect reliability and quality and all those sort of things. But, but certainly nationally, um, it's, it's been more of a challenge of late. Um, I mentioned we are ahead of the curve, um, and that's because we started sooner. Um, we're certainly not immune to any of these challenges. Um, our systems are still aging and we have a long range plan to address all those things, which is what we're here to talk about today. Um, but we are ahead of the curve and we'll kind of step back just a little bit as we go through this and kind of talk about the history, how Century 2 has evolved a little bit in each of our systems. Century 2 has a different flavor for each of our systems um, and we'll kind of walk through the uniqueness, but there's some, some cornerstones to each um, and we'll work through those as we go through this and then as, as Gabe mentioned, as I talk about electric, which is next, this is really uh, absent any any funding or anything related to broadband whatsoever. So just keep that in mind as we kind of walk through this. Um, John, yes, ma'am. Um, do we have an internal report card that we give ourselves? No, we don't. And we've, we've wrestled with this question in the past. Um, I, I think the best way of describing it is we're, we look at Century 2, a lot of that began in kind of, you know, 2000, mid-2000s and then in electric funding began in 2010. I think we're 10 years ahead at least of most people, if that makes sense. Um, when you look at the wastewater system that Derwin's gonna talk about, you know, with, with PACE 10, um, you know, we had to, to really rapidly improve things. So, you know, I don't know what the score would be, um, but I do like to think that, that we have addressed some of the high priority items earlier and as you talk about how Century 2 has evolved, we're now getting into more strategic and, and priority-based decisions as opposed to fixing what's, what's about to break or what is breaking, if that makes sense. Um, and I, and I, will, and I yeah. will add to that what you'll see. That's a great question, uh, uh, Commissioner Herbert. Uh, what you'll see through every utility, though, you'll see where our numbers are getting better, whether it be breaks, whether it be reliability, whether it be, you know, you'll see that throughout the SSOs. There are different things we measure, but we don't put a report card to it. It's a very interesting question. It makes me wonder about that thought, but everything is going in the right direction, so it tells us at least anecdotally we're doing some things in the right way, but a good question. Thank you for asking. I think you have to balance the effort it would take to produce it against the benefit, but I tell you what, if we could, 
use if, if they were to come in that same organization that gave the United States mm -hmm. those those uh, grades, if they were able to come in and use the same criteria to judge us, it'd be neat mm -hmm. to see whether or not we were at yeah. a B minus or we were at an A or whatever. Just, but again, you have to balance the cost and and in time and and effort against the benefit. But no, it, you're exactly right. It'd be great great for us if it comes out well. It'd be great for yeah. us to be able to tell well, the public. <laughs> and anecdotally, and I'll, I will say, well, yeah. well Brad, there's a couple of slides in here where I'm gonna brag on our employees. Um, but, but Gabe mentioned the awards. I, I think that's a basis to, I think you, you can provide a lot of different things and kind of toss it in there. And while not one thing will give you the perfect score, but the fact that we are, I'll talk about, you know, diamond level, um, RP3 for the electric system and all you, you kind of get a sense that that maybe we're better than most we may not be we're not out of the woods still working so a lot of work but maybe better than most in those areas so um, at least I like to think that um, I know our, our employees certainly work at that level um, you've seen this many many times so I'm not going to talk through this very much other than uh, to point out that we you know have currently have nine in feed stations I'm going to talk about another one that we're going to put in this area right here later on in the presentation I think you've heard me mentioned that before about Western Avenue uh, substation. I'll, I'll talk about that, but just geographically, that's where that's going to be at. Um, but certainly, that's just an overview of the electric system. Um, and so, we'll just kind of walk through here. As you all know, when it comes to the electric system, uh, reliability is our north star. So everything that we look at um, is, is focused on on safety and reliability. Um, and as you look at that, we, we try to always you know talk about so what's causing things when it's unreliable or when things have outages uh, and really vegetation continues to be um, the number one cause of outages you can see there about 56 percent um, and the majority of those are is actually vegetation outside of the zone so the areas that we clear and I'll talk about later spending millions of dollars on that's that's really not the biggest part of the vegetation that affects us and I'll show a picture later on uh, on, on kind of an exact scenario of that and what we're doing to address those things uh, certainly all the Century 2 infrastructure work that we're doing uh, is a big part of that. A lot of maintenance, a lot of things that go on. Uh, and grid modernization, we'll talk about how that's playing in um, to the future because it really is Century 2 plus grid modernization for the electric system in particular that's going to help us uh, make reliability better into the future. Um, so kind of going through here, um, again, I talked about we're going to go back to the beginning a little bit with some of the Century 2 just to kind of give you a basis for, for where we've been and where we're going. Um, the work early on, uh, this focuses in on a, a 2008 assessment of our system. Uh, at the time, I was in electric construction area, Gabe was in uh, electric engineering, and we were kind of working through the, the beginnings of what a Century 2 um, for our electric system could look like uh, with a lot of other folks. Um, in, in doing that, we were looking at um, how can we uh, begin uh, tackling the, the basics. So a good example is poles. Um, so wood poles are the predominant type of poles we have in our system. They have about a 50-year life cycle. So looking at those, we, we had pole assessments and pole inspections. And if you look at the decades in which they were installed, which is, which is at that bottom. So when you look at this 2000s to date, that was actually as of 2008. Okay, so there's been a lot more installed since then. So I want to make sure to make that clear. But, um, you know, we had a lot of aging poles at that point in time. And so we began to look at those that had the most priority of failure, the ones that were oldest, that were in the worst condition, that affected the most customers. And so we really began that journey kind of tackling the assets that needed it the worst, the fastest. Um, and that ca cascades through all the other areas. Um, underground cable is another example you've heard about that was direct buried. Um, at the time, we were having some of those underground cable failures um, at a rate of several per week. Um, and, and that's changed dramatically over time with, with getting those out of our system. So again, we prioritize that, um, worst ones first, and, and really got to work. Um, but since then, it has evolved. Some of those oldest, um, worst condition assets um, are well on their way of being replaced. Now, there, there's always the next worst, but, but hopefully the next worst is not as worst as the original worst. I'm, I'm saying that too. I'm not saying that in a good way, but I hope you understand what I'm saying. Um, <laughs> But as you look through that, for example, and I'll, I'll stay on poles just to continue that example. So if you go with a, a life cycle replacement rate of 2% or, or every 50 years, you know, 50 year life cycle, you know, replacing it just in time, um, that worked really well early on. Um, and I'll show you that, you know, we've replaced um, over 23,000 poles now, but now as we look at things, we're looking at it much more holistically. So instead of looking at individual pole conditions throughout our system, we're now looking at circuits. And we're looking at what does it take to make this circuit more reliable. Um, and some of that is indeed upgrading and changing out poles. It may be line size. 
it, it may be grid modernization and, and our new flosser technology and, and automating circuits. It could be strategic hazardous tree removal. There's a lot of different factors that now go into that. And so when our, when our groups, our electric stewardship team and operations and engineering get together to look at planning our work, they're bringing all these factors in as opposed to just simply looking at the age of an asset or the condition of an asset. So that has truly evolved. Um, another way it's evolved is, is in how we are managing our costs and being able to get more done um, with, with our, our maybe smarter thinking. Uh, so for example, with substations, instead of, again, looking at the age of those transformers, we do tremendous maintenance um, you know, in, our, in our systems, and they take great care of our systems. So some of our assets, frankly, last longer than what the industry would recommend because of how well we take care of them. Uh, and when I say we, I mean those that are actually taking care of them. Um, but they do such a good job. And so by looking at those and, and doing inspections, checking oil levels, infrared thermography, we're able to stretch out some of those replacements for those assets and by, by doing a really good maintenance. Um, and that saves us money in the plan and, and extends the life of those assets. Um, so, you know, a lot of a lot of really good work in these areas. So, so just some accomplishments overall. So substations, um, over half of those are complete, uh, and I'll show you a map here in just a minute that kind of illustrates that. Again, over 23,000 poles replaced so far, um, and we're doing a, a pole inspection currently um, that I'll talk about in a moment as well that will help us. Um, over 90% of our direct buried cable um, is, is now out of our system. Uh, we're working through that over the next few years. Um, but then the next thing will come up, which is the cable that's in conduit. Easier to get to, more efficient, less expensive to replace, um, but it's been in there um, for a while as well, and it'll be reaching its end of life as well. So looking at that next, and then certainly we talk a lot about this. I'll show you a map uh, of where we're at with our transmission lines, uh, where we're at 145 miles so far replaced of the 266 in our system. Uh, so here's the, the map. Oh, wait a minute. Back up here. Uh, before I get to the map, um, I talked about grid modernization and, and how it, it, it ties together with Century 2. Uh, and this is really where that different way of thinking and looking at things comes into play. Um, this picture was taken on March 24th. This is one of those out of the zone trees. So if we, we talk a lot about this. This picture um, was, was sent when we had this outage. This is um, over in the Pleasant Ridge Shod Road area, uh, affected uh, 3,700 customers that were out. But as you can see, this by, at least by my definition, of course I'm the one that said the substations are beautiful, um, you know, this is a very clean and, and nice right of way for our, for our electric lines. But this tree is outside of that, that fell. Um, and, and that's the kind of thing we're talking about that happens. And so, you know, we have to take those things in consideration because while that is outside of our zone, um, it still impacts customer reliability. And we have to think through those and try to figure out how do we make that work. Um, and so things like hazardous tree removal I'll talk about in a minute and other things are important. But one of the things we have to consider through grid modernization is when these outages occur, how do we get customers impacted the least? How do we minimize their outage, minimize that duration, or try to isolate them from being affected by that? We've talked about the, the Flosser technology. Uh, you heard this example um, earlier, and I just wanted to, to, to briefly mention it again. So December 24th, um, the, the Christmas Eve, Christmas Day kind of weekend storms that were there, 23,000 customers were impacted by that winter storm. Um, but there were 6,000 customers that weren't impacted long at all, brief momentary interruptions because of the existing distribution automation we had in our system. Um, that was a million minutes of savings and only 5% of our system so far has that technology. So I say that is that with, with hope and optimism that in doing this and investing in these technologies, we, we, we believe that that's a huge savings and reliability over time for our customers when things like this happen. And some of these we'll be able to find, but as you can see in that forest of trees, finding the one that's going to fall next might be difficult. So how do you respond to that? And this technology is going to help us moving forward. Um, along those same lines of vegetation management, we are increasing our funding in the plan for that. Um, and ramping that up um, in fiscal year 22, 12.9 million. Um, that is a million of that is for our capital projects that we'll talk about with our transmission or distribution upgrades. The remaining part of that is just simply circuit vegetation management and, and trimming in our system. Uh, we are returning to about a thousand miles per year uh, in the system and then adding in some of that hazardous tree component 
Um, and we're looking at that in, in smarter ways as well. We've strategically insourced a few things. We've talked before about our foresters uh, and bringing those in-house. We think that's going to help us a lot with our planning and our inspection. We've also got a crew now dedicated to this hazardous tree removal and what I would call unplanned uh, trimming needs that we have depending on the project and what's going on. So all that is, is helping us, we think, uh, deal with that number one cause of, of outages in our system. So that, that's one of the, the tools we'll be using moving forward uh, and continue to assess that. Um, I promised the maps, and I wanted to get there so fast earlier, I, I indicated it earlier, but this just kind of gives you an indication of, of what we've done since 2007 um, with some of the transmission and, and the substation work through Century 2. A lot of colors. I'll just kind of quickly walk through this legend. Um, hey, John. And, yeah. Tavi here. Uh, let's, so when you talked about 5%, you, you said you call them splicers or the switches? Flicer. Flicers. Yes. It's, so what, what's the process? So if... if the splicers are pretty effective at uh, disrupting the out of service time for customers. What is the timeline or process to get additional splicers in so that no matter where it happens that customers will have minimal disruption? So it's a great question. It's, it requires a couple of things. For one, the, the first few years we put them in place, we were piloting the technology. And so we have very complex uh, systems where we will have eight, nine, 10, 12 flosser units on a circuit that coordinate uh, and work things. We have some that are very simple with just a few devices on the system that kind of split the circuit around. We've, we've piloted that technology. Depending on how complex it is, it takes more time and effort because there's a lot of different things involved. So one is just the physical purchasing of the devices and hanging them on the systems, but then um, some of Derwin's folks that are in our station management services group have to program those because there's a lot of technology to, to tie those together. Um, so with that in our plan, and I'll walk through this, some of our distribution circuits, we're adding those in as we go. Um, and so it's really a pace functionality. And it, it, it's an, as we look at the circuits we're planning in fiscal year 22, each of the distribution circuits that we're upgrading will have this technology, mm -hmm. a flavor of that. It'll be some level of complexity on that circuit depending on how it's designed, how many customers are impacted, the density, all those sort of things. Um, it took us three, four years now working with Flosser to get 5%. Does that sound about right? And so that's about the pace. So maybe one to 2% per year, year if we're on the same pace. We've, we've historically had about a million dollars a year in the plan for this type of advanced technology as we move forward. Um, and, and so that's the, the plan moving forward. Where we're placing that technology, though, is on the circuits that are have the, the worst reliability numbers. Um, and so we take all that into consideration okay. when we put these in place. So we're hoping to affect reliability a little bit more by putting them in those areas. Uh, Commissioner, you may recall um, last month we did the presentation about the enhanced grid modernization that enables broadband. And it was like $700 million for the electric system. Um, that included full deployment of Flicer throughout the system, actually getting up to 1,200 devices. So um, that's in, you know, part of that $700 million uh, price tag on that. Um, so just so you know, we have been looking and, and thinking about that. And uh, obviously, if we, if we get that funding or if we go forward with the, the broadband plan, you're going to find a lot, lot more of those devices out there. Yeah, because as I think about it, and, uh, when we deployed the, the advanced meters and how that was such a smart, directed, intentional activity in which to provide in, in which to provide us data, I think also if you think about this, I think Fleischer's would be the, kind of that second level of that mm -hmm. where it's mm -hmm. it's absolutely critical and it's absolutely necessary for us to do so that we can we could improve our liability so when when and if a tree falls I mean people see minimal disruption and I think that's really in my estimation a big a, a, a big activity or initiative that we could we should certainly think about sure. in terms of people's reliability yeah I agree yeah. no, <laughs> no doubt it's, it's and, exactly and, and what you'll yeah, see yeah, in this right. plan and I think it's similar in all of our utility plans is trying to find the right balance of right. still caring for our infrastructure right. and still keeping that steady drumbeat of, of century two kind of fundamental replacement but also leveraging the technology as we're doing that 
Um, so it's a balanced plan, and certainly the, the one that, that Mark indicated is more aggressive in that particular area as you go um, for, for obvious reasons. Uh, but no, thank you for that. So this, this legend is a little bit complicated, um, and the next slide I promise is simpler, but I want to make sure you, you kind of get this piece real quick. So the substations that are clear are the ones that have not been upgraded yet. Um, so you may ask, so why? Well, those are just further out in the plan. Um, oftentimes they're, they're newer stations or are, are stations that don't have capacity issues right now, may not have the operational uh, flexibility needs that some of the others do, but they're, they're further out in the plan. Uh, we have two new substations since two, or infeed stations since 2007, uh, Volunteer in East Knox in red. Uh, two new distribution stations, uh, Dale Avenue in the Fort Sanders area, um, and then Cherokee Trail there at UT um, that were added as part of the plan. The, the yellow and the green circles are those that have been upgraded um, or improved in, in some, some way throughout the plan. Then as you turn to the lines, uh, the purple ones are those that have been upgraded, so the, that 145 miles of transmission lines upgraded with fiber that we've talked about, those are the ones in purple. Uh, the, the ones that are not in purple that are in black are the ones that are in the 2B that are out there in the plan further out. This next slide is just a little simpler. So everything that's been done is purple and yellow is to come. So hopefully that'll be a little easier as you look at the fiscal year 22. Um, and so you can kind of see some of the areas I'll be talking about, um, you know, Millertown Pike area, Halls area, Union County, Morrell Road uh, down here at the bottom as well. Substation upgrades, um, you can see Walker Road, Middlebrook, um, Fountain City that are in there. And then the wet, new Western Avenue substation I mentioned there that's, that's indicated in the star. Um, that we'll kind of talk through. So just geographically, you'll get an idea um, that in addition to looking at this, we're also um, you know, doing work throughout our entire system. So let's first talk about uh, the new Western Avenue end feed station. Um, you, you've heard me mention that before. That does add some operational flexibility and capacity uh, in our system uh, in that particular part. Uh, again, that's right off Western Avenue um, in the uh, Cumberland Estates area um, of town. It's really an ideal location, and I, I got a, found a better picture um, than you may have seen before. This is our existing Dalltown station uh, that's already there, at the, and, and then of course this is the property we're going to be building the station at right along Western Avenue. It's an ideal station because TVA's transmission lines already run through here, um, and so it's a place for them to be able to build a switching station as well, uh, and to put their equipment necessary for our end feed and for their um, for their work as well. Um, in the plan, um, across several years of $17 million in this particular fiscal year, fiscal year 22, we'll be spending three and a half million. That's mostly for the site work, the beginning of the structural work, and then you'll, after that you'll see a lot of the equipment um, purchases, which is uh, certainly uh, heavy in the plan. Uh, I mentioned this before as well, we're having a public meeting. Uh, the date has been selected for April 29th, and this is just a chance for the residents in the area, about 1,100 mailings. Uh, are going out today in addition to social media updates as well. Uh, just to kind of talk about the, the impact, we do this for all of our major projects uh, that impacts our community. Um, we'll talk about and show them some renderings of the site, different views as to how they will see that um, in their area and obviously the, the reliability benefits from an from electric perspective um, that are there. Um, we've also got a dedicated um, customer support resource throughout that project and we'll make sure they're aware of that. Uh, as we go through this, um, and like a lot of our projects, we'll have a blog as well uh, for those that, that want to keep up with that um, in that project. So uh, looking forward to that. Um, it'll be a virtual public meeting. I'm not sure we've done one of those, so uh, this will be a, a good chance to see how uh, we get that information out there, but we're looking forward to that um, as we uh, move forward with this project. Moving on to some of the transmission and distribution projects in fiscal year 22. Um, Right at 11 million in, in the transmission lines. Uh, I mentioned the Millertown Pike, Morrell Road, Cunningham Road um, areas. Uh, those transmission lines uh, were built in, in the 50s, 1955 to 59 time frame. Um, so uh, it's time to improve the poles and the wires and everything associated with that and, and continue our, our loop of fiber throughout the system. Um, those distribution lines, uh, again, those are prioritized and have that more holistic approach. Uh, that are in there. Uh, similar areas um, that are in there, so, so Middlebrook, Oak Ridge Highway area, uh, we've got some work in Union County and Fountain City and Halls, um, Duncan Road, Rocky Hill area, uh, Alcoa Highway, um, Woodson Drive area as well. So, so several of those projects 
of various sizes and lengths um, throughout our work area for about $7 million there. I mentioned the pole inspection work that we're doing as well. Um, and we're doing a very comprehensive assessment. In the past, we've kind of gone through our system uh, a year at a time and kind of split it up. This one's a, a larger uh, project um, at, at, at one and a half million dollars to really look at um, a current state of our system. Um, we paused that last year during the pandemic, um, trying to find ways of, of, of reducing our expenses, but that's been resumed and we expect that to be done by the end of the year. And that'll give us a lot of information about the current status of our polls and our attachments and all the things that are with that. Um, also happy to talk about uh, a community solar project um, that we have in our plan. Um, yes, sir. They're putting in uh, a structure to support. The, see, those in, there's insulators that are right here on the side of this. So the, so the line comes through this way, and actually there's lines going this way as well. But they're just framing uh, that piece to hold some insulators that are coming off there. Um, I'm not sure. That's not that, a capacitor area, is that? That is a 69 kV switch being switch, installed. Yeah, okay. Yeah, I can't see switch. the top of it. Yeah, you can't see the top yeah, of it. Yeah, so that, I, get, I have to give Gabe something. I can't help. Okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You want, yeah, yeah. Gabe can go on this for a long time. Yeah. Um, what it was? Well, that's why he's got you sitting next to him. You know, there's, there, yeah, there, there's, yes, absolutely. Yeah. Um, so, community solar. Um, you know, we've talked a lot about the Green Invest in the past, um, and, and adding over 500 megawatts. Um, you know, with a $1.6 million annual purchase. So from a solar perspective, that's 20% um, of our load and, and really a huge commitment to solar um, through TVA's program. But the TVA agreement also allows us to do some, some local things as well within, within our uh, distribution. And, and this is um, a first one um, that we're looking at uh, up to 700 kilowatts of, of solar in a city-owned site. Um, this site is, uh, right off Lorraine Street, Middlebrook, uh, just east of Liberty Street, um, and it's right along um, I-40, that's the westbound lane um, that's there, uh, about two acres, um, and, and looking to partner with TVA and the City of Knoxville to put this in there. Um, I am not the right person to talk about the details and the intricacies of this, but it's a system by which uh, customers can subscribe. Um, and in doing so, it, there's, there's customers who may not be able to afford solar or don't want to have that kind of infrastructure on their property, whether it's a business or a home. This allows them to subscribe to a community system by which they can get some of the, the financial benefits on their bill and also contribute to sustainability in a, in a, in a city or a larger owned area. So we're looking forward to this. It is in the budget. Uh, still working through some details with easements and, and other agreement things that go along with that, but it's good that it's in the plan. Um, ideally, we'd love to begin working on that in summer of, uh, of this year, uh, probably about an 18-month project once things get going. Um, obviously, more to come. I'm, I'm sure we'll keep you um, updated on this project as we move forward, but this is a, an, indeed an exciting part of our plan. Yes. What uh, percentage does our long-term contract with TVA allow for us to generate? What was that, Mark? You, you know what? Five? Five? Yeah. Five percent. Five percent. It's eighty megawatts is in my head. Yeah. Eighty megawatts. So it's pretty and significant. If this I remember correctly, KW. it's less than one. Yeah. Um, yeah. It does not count towards that. Oh, it would not count. This does not count towards that. Yeah. Nor does the green invest. Um, okay. Correct. Yeah. That's correct. So. Yeah. So yeah, we. So we're just we're. This is not our project. This we're we're participating in a larger project or. And with the city, and what they gave us the land, we're leasing it from them. But it's really our project, and then we still have to work out a lot of details for how this is going to work, where customers can subscribe to it and, and pay towards it. And in all likelihood, we will have again, a lot of details to work out on that side. We really haven't gotten there yet. But we, you know, for our low-income customers, we want them to be able to participate as well. So we'll be looking at somehow that, that they can do that. But again, we really haven't sat down and walked through how all that will work. How does this not count towards our generation? 
right. how does this not count towards our generation yeah, cap? Towards that five percent? Yeah. Because this was in place, we were already working towards this before the TVA partnership agreement, and basically they basically said this won't count towards that. Yeah. So, so this is many of our projects are. I don't mean to be cruel about it, but pass-throughs uh, from TBA makes it possible for us. We we agree to do it or not to do it. This is something we're doing on our own, though. That is that is correct. But you know, TBA is part of this as well yeah. because you know they all the power comes from them eventually. But yeah. Yeah. Thank you. So what what so have we thought about what our TVA five percent with that with those eighty megawatts would look like? Not not to any detail. There's so many different things that you could do with that, um, whether it be solar or other technologies, batteries. I mean, that's something that's emerging as we speak. Okay. Um, the, the hard part for us is going to be in, in a metropolitan area is the land. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's just, you know, the big cities are going to have trouble. You know, when you've got Googles and Amazons wanting property, you're going to not outbid those folks for green stuff. So we've got to figure that out long term. We have not pursued anything definitely, but we're always open to ideas and talk, talking about that. So, yes, we have, we're going to do this project to get, a, get our toes Kind of wet and the, okay. this technology, and see where it goes from there. Okay. Yeah. And we have we. There you go. You know, I, I think we should put one right in Sequoia Hills, <laughs> right on here. Right. <laughs> okay. So we we talked a lot about I mentioned you know grid modernization. So grid modernization plus Century Two is really our path, and on, on the electric system. Uh, to improve reliability, to move things forward. Um, fiber is obviously key to modernizing our technology, our, our facilities, um, working those things through. Um, you know, customer reliability expectations are changing very, very rapidly. Um, we know the impact of, of what the pandemic has had on people working from home and people having school at home. We've talked about the, 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 the broadband piece of that, but just from electric reliability fundamentally, having that uh, reliability while you're, while you're trying to do your business at home is important. Um, and then obviously the technology, we've talked about our technologies, but the technologies of our customers and the equipment of our customers is obviously more and more reliant on, on, on high level, high quality reliability. Um, and so as we continue to invest in Century 2 and in grid modernization, it's going to open up future applications, not only for us, but for our customers. We've talked in the past about how it will impact electric vehicles, potential use for batteries in the future, so forth and so on. So a path forward, and, and that is included in this plan and, and continues to move forward in that. Uh, I mentioned bragging on our employees. Um, this is the brag slide, um, really kind of looking at um, what we've done over the past. Um, I'll start with, with Treeline USA. We've been a Treeline USA um, city uh, in the work that we've done for over 18 years. Uh, that, that continues, so as we continue to to talk about vegetation management, we do so in a, in a safe and a responsible way. Um, and then also, um, from a RP3 perspective, um, we received notification that we've got the diamond level certification yet again, um, which is just really says a lot about the hard work of our employees because it, it looks at things across a lot of areas, not only reliability, but safety and workforce development, a variety of, uh, of areas. So, so very proud uh, to mention that as well. John, yes, sir. To um, to speak to Commissioner Herbert's earlier question, it might be helpful if, uh, when we get something like the diamond level designation, to know how many systems in the United States uh, have that. Like only only two percent of the mm -hmm. uh, uh, of the systems uh, have that. That that might give us some yes. sense of uh, relative to the rest of the. Yeah. yeah, we'll we'll know that. I think we we've gotten. They announced the. They've announced it to us. Yes. I think they're announcing it at their annual conference this month. That's this month. This month. So month. when they release that, we'll have a better idea of who else is in that category, and then those, those that are in other categories as well, that are also doing a really good job. I, I will tell you, there's about 2,000 public power utilities in the country, and I know we're in the top 100. I can tell you that pretty. Well, I'll, I'll get you that information. It's pretty so. Yeah. So I, that's a great. Yeah. 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 Can't uh, handle a storm. How is it going to handle everybody plugging in an electric vehicle? Um, and you know, I think that as we progress through 
um, you know, talking about things for the uh, future and for budgeting, somehow that piece has got to get communicated mm -hmm. to the to the public because uh, all the naysayers, that's the easiest thing for them to say. And uh, I know people talked about these storms in Texas and, you know, if they can't get electricity, you know, in a storm, just think about the fact that you wouldn't be able to even move a vehicle because you wouldn't have electricity. Um, it, it's something I think to keep in mind on our communication piece because we've got to try to bridge that gap in some way. Yeah, no doubt. I think certainly one of the more reasons why the reliability is critical, making sure that our system as is as hardened as possible when storms come through. Um, just anecdotally, kind of going back to how Century Two has changed things. When when I was working in electric construction, we would have normal spring storms and we we would work overnight and into the next day on, on just a normal typical spring storm and as we began to increase our funding and vegetation management beginning to change out those worst poles things just began to change the crews noticed it um, and they would comment that that things just don't break like they did years ago um, now last few years had a lot of you know wet weather we've had you know some big storms we've had some things we're not immune there is no doubt about that and when when mother nature um, brings her best um, our best sometimes isn't good enough um, you know and and that's okay we're, we're working toward that but um, i think you raise a really good point from a capacity perspective um, we feel really confident about our need to serve electric vehicles and all those sort of things and 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 honestly, I think with the EV rate and other things that are out there, um, there's some great opportunities for everybody. Uh, but certainly continuing to invest in Century 2 and tying the technology through grid modernization is going to help us solve that issue uh, over time. And I'm just wondering if there's any, um, when he talks about broadband, mm -hmm. um, are there any incentives for utility companies? And, and that's just high level. I know that's out there right now, but are you hearing anything about any incentives for um, utility companies going forward in this upcoming administration? There were a lot of things, and Gabe, you're welcome to jump in here yeah, as well. Um, there were a lot of things in, in his infrastructure plan that came out of the White House that, that touched on everything from Century 2 to broadband. It touched us in a lot of different ways. Um, we're optimistic that, that, that some of that will find our way. We'd certainly love to be able to um, use some of that funding to offset um, some of the, the, our debt and rates and things moving forward. It's just not clear yet what will actually happen yeah um, i know it's, it's up in the air for yeah everything, so but, this, but we're watching it very closely very good. um and and for all of our systems and and our industry partners are watching it as well mm -hmm. um so yes we're definitely keeping our eye on it um, as we move forward um hopeful for more certainly so i'll answer both questions um celeste um we're not worried about EVs, but we haven't been saying that, so let's just let's be better about that. We, we, we'll take all they can put out there and we'll serve them just fine. So we'll, we'll address that. It's a, good, it's a great point. Um, and then secondly, uh, Adrian, the, uh, I've been looking at it very close. We are being a, a part of these, these big national organizations like AWWA, which is the Water Works Association, mm -hmm. APPA. They're giving us just, you know, every day I get an email. Here's what's in the plan maybe. Here's what the plan may be. So we're going to keep a really close eye on water infrastructure, wastewater infrastructure dollars in particular. Mm -hmm. Broadband are the three that I hear the most, mm -hmm. that have been practiced the most. And so I've made a comment to our staff, you know, we've got to be on it and ready to go. You know, right. who knows who qualifies, but we got to try. Yep. And so, yes, we're, I'm watching it like a hawk, if, as they put it, so to keep an eye on that because Very it's good. been the first time since 2008 or nine that anything like this has been talked about. And so, you know, yeah. we'll see what we can get. So. Okay. Thank you. Okay, on to the natural gas system. This slide deck is a little shorter than electric, um, so you have that to look forward to. Um, natural gas system uh, serves a little bit over 105,000 customers. Uh, obviously, the, the service area it looks a little different in this one, uh, more of a Knox County look to it um, in general. Um, you all are familiar with, with where we take gas from the pipeline at each of these yellow dots. I'll just draw your attention to this yellow dot, which is Level Road, because I'll be talking about it here in just a little bit. 
Um, but natural gas does look different from a Century 2 perspective than some of the other systems because it is indeed our newest system um, and is actually influenced by other factors including customer growth. Um, we felt like this slide was really good to kind of show because um, you know 2008 time frame you had that recessional period but since then uh, you look at 2011 to date um, our request for natural gas service um, has doubled since 2011 uh, and you can kind of see somewhere in that 900 range to, to close to 2000 as you're moving forward and that's just continuing to grow in those areas uh, as our gas system continues to grow and expand um, as we go through here and we actually have about seven million dollars in fiscal year 22 to continue to support that growth and expansion of our gas system um, these these extensions really do provide customer choice um, as we move forward and and a couple of examples of this is in the Shoto community um, also northern expansion to Raccoon Valley and Hardin Valley all last year and then some of that work is is obviously continuing uh, to go as well um, and so you have extensions to serve new developments and you also have um, opportunities like connect to comfort where um, as we pass existing customers we give them the choice uh, of, of if they want to uh, go with natural gas as a fuel source instead of propane or whatever other fuel type that they may have uh, and do that in a turnkey manner. So those programs are intended to really handle both of those things as well. Um, sometimes as, as we pass people or get to people, it, it really becomes both an economic and environmental opportunity for some of our customers. Um, we've talked about how our, our public CNG station uh, helped some areas or some companies change from a diesel fuel mix to a to a CNG mix um, and in this particular case with Duracap um, that we were able to reach um, in the Raccoon Valley area uh, one of the the asphalt uh, companies in our service area um, but by being able to serve them with natural gas we're able to see a 36 percent production in their carbon dioxide emissions um, because they're switching from diesel fuel so sources um, to natural gas um, which is a really big deal and just a, a couple of quick facts here with that that's 732 metric tons um, of CO2 reduced um, and that's 1.6 million pounds of that a parallel um, for, for me to understand is about 150 passenger cars removed from the road annually um, so a big deal and it also saves them money uh, so that's a really good win-win solution um, when it comes to to some of the work that we're doing with extending our natural gas system as well these extensions also oftentimes, from a, just a system and Century 2 perspective, help connect our systems together and provide more resiliency and operational flexibility uh, throughout our system as well. I did mention that, that Century 2 does look a little bit unique and new um, or different with, uh, with, with natural gas. We oftentimes actually talk about our, our distribution integrity management program, our DEMP program, even more so than Century 2 with natural gas because it's really about e evolving our system making our system more resilient um, and, and less about the age of the assets. And there's still some of that, and we'll talk about that in some of the projects. Um, but some of our older uh, pipe types like cast iron and ductile iron that you've heard about in the past are, are removed from our system. So now we're looking at, at, at how do we improve and replace and advance newer pipe types. Um, there's still some, um, this low pressure steel that I'll mention, that we still look at. It's still good pipe. It's still effective. It still works really, really well and reliable but you'll see some work based on our inspections in this particular area in the plan uh, to continue to, to further our systems. I mentioned the, the DEMP program. Uh, you've seen this slide many times, just talking about how we know our system, prioritize um, our work, um, and, and really evaluate uh, how we're doing. Uh, that translates into programs like our low pressure steel program, uh, things like leak surveys and other things that we do. The resiliency program, that looks at how does our system most resilient. Our number one cause of uh, damage to our systems or pro is, is dig-ins. So we look at, this one particularly looks at if we have a dig-in, um, how can we look at any single points of failure that reduces the impact to, to 300 customers or more. So those help us to understand where we can make our system more resilient, just like thinking about the electric system, to minimize that impact if someone was to dig into us or there's a situation like that. So some of the major projects for fiscal year 22, some of the low pressure steel, you can see a couple of those projects that are there. We'll be spending 2.3 million 
in the plan uh, to continue to replace those areas that are more aging and in need of replacement. Um, we've also got a couple of projects that are, that are capacity related, uh, sizing of pipe related. Uh, it could be some, some operational characteristics associated that, with that, um, and, and both of those are, are older segments. Um, John Severe um, pipe segments, 1968, um, downtown West, 1951. So just replacing some of those aging assets that are there at, at about two and a half million each. Uh, for those projects. Uh, Lovell Road's a little different. Um, that one's been on the horizon for many, 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 many years. Um, and it's a, a potential Knox County Highway project to widen that section. Um, and that just so happens to have that one large uh, end feed station uh, that, that we get um, gas from the, from the pipeline. So really important to us for that particular reason. Um, so we've got money in the plan um, to relocate a section of that and to get out ahead of that project. Um, so that we can protect that section of our pipeline. Uh, really not a lot of money in fiscal year 22 compared to the overall project budget, but just getting those design dollars, some of the easements out of the way and begin to begin that process. So, so more to come on that, um, but it certainly, as you can see, but just by the, by the dollar amount of the project looks different than the rest. John. Yes. Uh, quick question. Mm -hmm. uh, is there anything in century two that uh, will help address what we learned from the pipeline outage, is there anything that we need to be doing from a capital standpoint that would protect us from a significant um, outage? So yes and no, and, and, and Mark, you're welcome to, to chime in as well if you want. I think the, the pipeline issue that impacted us was really a pipeline uh, thing that, you know, we had different points of delivery, unfortunately, the main point of delivery that we have or the main pathway was the one that was compromised. Um, and, and that's, you know, many miles away from us and really outside of our control. Now, with that being said, having our system more resilient, having more um, upgraded regulator stations and gate stations and ways in which we can move gas and adjust pressures through our system allows us to be able to manage that better. Um, and so as we talk about um, I've got a slide here in just a moment that I think will touch on a part of that about how we make our system a little bit more resilient into the future. Um, I don't know that it would, it would change a major pipeline issue like the one we experienced, um, but certainly if something was of a lesser degree um, or we have more capacity constraints on the pipeline, it can help us manage that to some degree. Is that, that fair, Mark? It on and on. Yeah, I think so. Um, you know, part of it is just we, we only have one downstream pipe that we get everything off East Tennessee natural gas. There, there are different delivery points into our system. Uh, we did um, have a, a new interconnect with TETCO, uh, which still comes into East Tennessee, but it comes in at a different point, and we're getting gas flow on that as well. So we have looked to, to do some things strategically for how you know, where we receive all, all the various gas. Um, um, but ultimately, when you are somewhat restricted, uh, just our geographic location, one pipeline, you know, if we were in Nashville, if we're in Memphis, they have three or four interstate pipelines, and they diversify and, and use some of uh, all of them. So that helps their situation. We just don't have that luxury, those of us in the East Tennessee area. But, um, yeah, John is correct, but we have done some things as far as just uh, where we're getting the gas in from East Tennessee natural gas um, to, to help alleviate a little bit of that. Uh, so I mentioned some things longer term. Um, we actually engaged a consultant, uh, Kimley Horn, uh, this past year to, to look long term um, at our gas master plan. You've talked about, we've, we've talked a little bit about our water resiliency strategy and, and other systems have similar plans as well. Uh, we looked at, at, at a variety of things. Um, and they came in and looked at our DEMP program, and I looked at a lot of things that we're doing, how, how the system's growing, uh, the resiliency things we talked about, um, you know, and, and some really good news came out of that evaluation. First of all, they looked at our, the first, I guess the front half of our long range plan those first four or five years and didn't recommend any changes whatsoever. They felt like we had the right plans, the right priorities, the right things in place, um, and felt like that our, our system was very robust um, and that we were incorporating those best industry practices. So good news there. Um, they also had some, some ideas for us to consider longer term, mostly around that resiliency uh, point. Uh, and in particular, those areas of continued growth, especially out west, 
uh, and how we can look at make, making sure we have the resiliency and the operational flexibility to continue to, to serve and to grow uh, those customers. So um, more to come on the back half of our plan in future years about this, but, but certainly we are continuing to look long, long range at this system. Um, and then again, our, key, our employees are key to our success and all of our systems certainly is the case uh, with, with natural gas. We were hoping to be able to uh, announce today uh, a new award designation. That's not going to be released until May. Um, we have submitted our 2021 application um, for American Public uh, Gas Association SOAR program. Um, and we, as you recall, we had a, a silver designation in, in 2018. We're always shooting for gold. So fingers crossed that we're uh, going to be closer to that uh, or achieve that with this particular application. Um, but we, we, we feel like we have done some things to put ourselves in better position uh, for that particular deal. And once we, once we get that award, we'll certainly share that with you as well. But it certainly takes um, a lot of folks behind the scenes to put something like this as well as RP3 and other awards uh, in play. So that's all I've got for the gas system.
Sir, the floor is yours. So before he begins, I do want to give you a statistic. I can't stand not having numbers handy. So All right. There are 2,000 public utilities in the country, and 100, 126 of them have designated diamond. Wow. For 126 of 2,000 plus. That's pretty good. So anyway. That's great. I think that's a statistic we need to share with the, all our constituencies. Um, the, um, today we're going to start with wastewater and then I'll follow with our wastewater, our water discussion. So um, you've seen this map before. Um, it is our uh, service area for a wastewater system. You can see the area in the center is the city of Knoxville and you can see we serve a very good portion of East Knox County as well. Um, we've got 63 pump stations. We have four wastewater treatment plants and as you know we also have um, six relatively new storage facilities for our wastewater system uh, as a result of the consent decree um, and we serve 72,000 customers. Um, we, we obviously have been, uh, overall, our attention on wastewater is on environmental stewardship. That's really overall our focus. Uh, but next fiscal year, I'll add, is, is extremely important for our wastewater system in that it's the final year of our consent decree. Um, and as, as you all know, heavy rains, floods, uh, certainly impacts wastewater systems, and, and we're no different in that regard. Uh, much of the focus on the consent decree has actually been on reducing sanitary sewer overflows. So that focus just simply continues for us. Um, we're also uh, in our plan planning on uh, replacing our gaseous chlorine um, disinfection method at two of our wastewater plants, um, that Kauai and Fourth Creek. And what that does is we'll move to alternative safer technologies than the chlorine gas. Um, plus, in addition, we'll be upgrading pipes and upgrading pump stations throughout our system. So I'll take you back just for a second and remind you that uh, PACE 10 began as we began the consent decree in 2004, um, and it outlined 134 specific projects that we had to undertake. Um, and then several years later, some projects at two of our plants were added to the consent decree as a requirement. Um, and as well, we also created and, and or um, enhanced inspections and monitoring programs and maintenance programs for our collection system for um, as during the consent decree. So I wanted to touch base on one of the programs. One of the programs of our wastewater collection system is blockage abatement. Um, that's where we use flow monitoring technology plus remote cameras to gather data. And um, you can see the photos on the right. This is of the inside of our wastewater lines. Uh, the top one, as you can see, is where rainwater has found its way through a pipe joint and do thus does impact our wastewater system. Um, the one on the bottom, you can see where roots have started to penetrate into our wastewater lines. And obviously it starts very small, but it continues to grow and grow and grow over time. Um, so our blockage abatement program is, is honestly just an ongoing, continuous uh, investigation um, for, throughout our system. We continue to look for issues. We cut roots. We clean the lines. Um, also, uh, obviously, we hope we avoid blockages as well as prevent sanitary sewer overflows. Um, so since the beginning of the consent decree, uh, we've, been, um, we've come a long way. We have evolved. Um, all the specified 134 projects associated with the consent decree within the collection system have been completed. And as you all know, we're almost finished with all the plants projects. We're under construction on our last one. Um, we've also added programs to inspect and prioritize our plants and our pump stations, as well as our uh, storage facilities throughout the collection system. And as a result, we have been able to replace 420 miles of pipe. Um, this is pretty significant, uh, this slide is, and I'll share with you. We were at 75% older pipes when we started the consent decree or our PACE 10 program. 40% um, older, older pipe now. So that means we have 60% newer pipe. Another way I'd like to say is that the majority of our system is newer pipe types in our collection system now. Um, honestly, back in 2004, I'm not sure if I could have remembered, uh, been able to say that or thought I could even say that in my tenure here at KUB. Uh, that's a pretty big deal. Um, I'll also add that over 80% of our pump stations, it's been upgraded since the beginning of the consent decree. 
Um, also, we've been storage six storage tanks in our and that obviously helps us with the wet weather conditions and the peak flows in our wastewater collection system. So, um, the collective work associated with uh, with our investments have resulted in a 70% reduction in manhole overflows in our system. Um, I want to add as well, that comes on the heels of two of the wettest years we've had in the history in Knoxville. 2019, it was the third wettest year. In fact, February of 2019 was the wettest February in Knoxville. Do you remind me, what year did we take over wastewater? 1987. So part yeah, of that, the city owned it. So this, this, this is... This is really good news. Well past yeah, that time period, and yeah. yes, uh, I, I honestly, 70% uh, reduction is pretty phenomenal. Again, the rainfalls that we've had, you all know what the rainfall has been the last two years, uh, the floods that were associated with all that. In fact, last year, it was a top 10 wettest year in the city of Knoxville. So um, yet still 70% reduction in our manhole overflows. So, um, as you know, we had a pretty fast pace to make some improvements to begin with, uh, pretty significant. And we were replacing pipe at 25 miles per year. That was the pace. That's a big deal. Um, but it obviously got us to a point where we are today, where we have majority of our system is newer pipe types. However, we do think there's a better sustainable pace for our pipe replacements going forward. Uh, now that we're in a position where we do have majority of newer pipe types, we think somewhere about north of 1.5% of the system being replaced on an annual basis is the right amount going forward. So you can see in our long-range plan, we've made appropriate adjustments. So um, we're nearing the close out of the consent decree. You're aware of the, the final project, the BEHRC project at Kauai. Um, it's a nearly $50 million project. Uh, to be complete this fiscal year. You're, you're also aware, given the pandemic as well as some contractor delays, we're working with the EPA, we're in discussions as we speak, uh, about potentially modifying the deadline for that particular project, and that's going on as we speak. Um, we're also incorporating the projects that we've created and the programs under the consent decree, and we're adding it into our Century 2 O&M manual so that we can continue that progress that we have made. Um, also, with the large expenditures that we've made in the plants and the pump stations and, and throughout our system and the um, uh, throughout, um, we think we're in a lot better place now. So in the long range plan, you will see that um, we will be reducing the amount of capital expenditures in the long haul. And also you'll see fewer spikes in the long range plan. But regardless, as you know, our commitment to Century 2 absolutely remains and we will continue to focus on our Century 2 programs. And in case we get asked, uh, commissioners, the, the project on, on Neyland is really only a few, a few months, uh, going to be a few months late. It, it's, yes. not, it's not years and years. That is correct. Right. Yes, we, we do expect to finish it this fiscal year. Has that situation improved? Yes, it has. Yes, we have a, a new... Uh, time frame provided from the contractor, and we've been talking with them. And they're busy out there working. So. They have increased, yes, the resources and the time they work. Thank you. So, um, for example, um, I did mention we, our commitment to Century 2 absolutely continues. None of these are consent decree projects on this slide. All these are Century 2 projects. For example, a quarter of a billion dollars is planned to be invested in our system in the long range plan for pipe upgrades. As well, uh, I'll, I'll just mention one of the other projects on this list is the Jones Street pump station uh, and Force Main. It actually began this fiscal year. We, uh, Gabe mentioned we had some projects we postponed. This is one of those we put on pause. We've now been able to restart that project. It's south of Calhoun's on the river on the south side. Uh, it replaces a current pump station uh, that serves a good portion of South Knoxville pumps the water basically north and eventually is treated at Kauai. Um, if you look at the architectural rendering, you can see the city county building in the background. That's so you can kind of get a feel for where it's located. Uh, this project actually looks relatively small if you look at the architectural rendering. There's a lot of work with this one. Um, not only are we put an force main across the river, it's a 50-foot excavation in order to put the appropriate appurtenances associated with this pump station in place. So eventually you're going to see a big, huge 50-foot hole 
um, as they build back up. But ultimately, that's what you'll see. So I, I did want to finish up the wastewater portion just for a second and, and mention um, and brag about our KEB employees. Um, the consent decree was a dadgum challenge. Um, there was unbelievable amount of, yeah, it's a really big deal. <laughs> you know, uh, the project, the capital and projects just ramped up significantly. The new programs, the expanded programs associated with this consent decree were phenomenal. And our employees just, just jumped up, jumped in. Um, as a result, they maintained their focus. They were also able to maintain solid communications with our regulators, even improve the relationship with the regulators. That's how much they invested into this, this new improvement with the consent decree. And at the same time, we received numerous operational awards throughout the time frame. And then I'll just finish, as you can see the, the quote over to the right, our regulators even noticed our employees work and the results that they were able to achieve. So I love it when we can maintain solids in our wastewater system. <laughs> <laughs> solid communication, solid whatever it needs to be. Absolutely, we were solid. <laughs> Here, here's, here's, sure, here, here's an example of, of uh, I, David Bryce with the City of Knoxville sent me an email um, during some, uh, with a concerned customer. Um, and I responded back to him and, and that customer. And one example is like roadways. The roadways get flooded, right? Mm -hmm. It's designed for a certain type of storm event. And at some point, the, the piping can't take it all and it starts flooding the roadways. Mm -hmm. Well, that also can impact our wastewater system, right? right. Um, the, the more flooding that you have, the more opportunities. Because if you think about it, most of our wastewater lines are gravity. They go along creeks, mm -hmm. they go in low areas, and so that's the first place that water starts standing. So guess what? It does penetrate our piping system. Mm -hmm. it, as a result, it potentially backs up our manholes. Oh, right. It potentially gets overflows and has problems with our plants. Right. So um, it's a significant impact to wastewater systems all over the place. Right. It's just a matter of, you know, helping to, to prevent the flooding. At the same time, you're trying to prevent the, the flooding to enter into the wastewater pipes. We don't control the prevention part of the flooding. We, we do, do not. not. Right. That's but correct. The, the, when it floods, it goes in through the holes in the top of the manhole. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And that's not the only place. It can. It, there's multiple places yeah. that it can absolutely Pump penetrate. Stations, so. Yes, and and also a, a water system, for example, is pressurized, right? Our wastewater system is not, and so, however, when the ground gets saturated, the ground is pressurized. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it's for, trying to find its way into any opportunity to get into a wastewater pipe. And I'll add one thing. We're fortunate that we don't have what they call, a lot of cities call combined systems where their wastewater and stormwater are combined. That's nightmarish. We don't, we, we had a little bit of that many, many years ago and split that. So we're, we're fortunate we don't have to deal with that. You know, some cities that's a, that's a major issue right now going on. So. Yeah, that, early on that was one of our first projects was to eliminate all our combined sewer. Um, where water, where the stormwater and the sewer were together. Sequoia Hills was one of the areas where a lot of that occurred. So that was one of the first things we did under the consent decree was to eliminate that. Sequoia Hills, okay, you can recombine them if you want to. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions with the wastewater system? Okay. Um, the water system, very much like the wastewater system, um, it's outlined in red on the map. We do, again, uh, serve a good portion of East Knox County. Uh, for our water system, we have 26 pump stations, 28 storage facilities, and as we all know, we have a single water treatment plant that serves our 81,000 customers. Um, I, I do want to remind you that we were able and continue to, we were able to maintain and continue to serve two wholesale customers. Um, 
in the remote eastern portion of our system, Shady Grove Utility District in the town of Dandridge. Um, they get their water from us, they move it through their pipes, and they ultimately provide water to their customers. So water quality is absolutely paramount for our, our water system, and we all know that. Um, we also have a focus on resiliency. The board has endorsed a water supply master plan, which is basically a series of projects to provide a second treatment train for our water treatment facility. And so we're well underway on that project, and we'll touch on that a little bit later. Um, we're also continuing to invest in resiliency in our system. You, you heard John talk about the gas and having resiliencies and backups. Uh, same thing with the water. We're continuing to look for opportunities to provide that resiliency. <coughs> also, um, we're continuing to invest in our, in our just replacing pipe and pump stations in our system. So uh, back in time, in 2006, this was really our first Century 2 program for KUB. Um, it was basically we were having a large number of main breaks in our system, and it was increasing. So uh, we kind of understood that Paste 10 was successful. So we modeled our water Century 2 after that Paste 10 for wastewater. Um, and, and in fact, we used the data that was available to us at the time. And as you can see, the red was galvanized pipe. It was obvious outlier, um, and so we actually uh, really attacked primarily galvanized pipe first. So we focused on the pipes in the system primarily early on in our Century 2 program. But we have since evolved to a blank slide. <laughs> I don't know how that happened. <laughs> yeah, whoa. <laughs> Um, we've evolved um, Century 2 program. Our water supply master plan I did mention ha is new um, and it is well underway. We've created programs to collect data for our tanks and pump stations. Um, we've expanded to valve inspections and maintenance throughout our system. Um, and we've also been able to, to improve effectiveness and efficiencies as well as to reduce costs to move some of the work that was done by contractors to be performed by KUV crews. Um, so, um, in the, we also, I wanted to share with you two leak types on this slide. The top one is an obvious leak. We all can see that one. We wish they were all that obvious. Unfortunately, they're not. Um, the one on the bottom could actually be much worse, and it could last for many, many years. Um, so, we use programs to help us analyze and invest, investigate and pinpoint and locate um, these type of leaks. In fact, we're the first utility in the United States to actually use a particular um, software program as well as data analytics to help us find and pinpoint those kind of leaks. What, what are we looking at? It, that's a water valve. Um, so that, that's just a, you take it off and you can spin and turn, close, open and close a valve. So how does it leak? How do you... you can't detect it here. It's below the surface, and that's why we have to use the newer technology and the software and the flow monitoring that we have in place to help us kind of look and isolate and find. It's a, it's a science. Is you can. Concrete? I'm sorry. Concrete that's asphalt. asphalt. That's just a, a an intersection per se. That's that's in the street, and we've got a, a valve that's that's actually a valve cover. You take off the valve cover. There's a valve stem bound in it, and you actually manually turn the valve. So, um, does that make sense? Um, I, I did mention that we were the first in the United States to actually use a find and fix program. Um, so, we piloted actually the last two years. And as a result of the success, we found quite a bit of what I'm calling home runs um, that we normally would not have even found. So, as a result, uh, we're going to invest a million dollars a year in a long range plan for our find and fix program. So over the past 15 years, uh, we've been able to upgrade 200 miles of pipe. We're now at 64% newer pipe types. Um, and our galvanize is nearly out of our system. As I mentioned, that was where we attacked first um, strategically, and we're continuing to, to attack it as well. Uh, pipe repairs down by 57% since 2008. 
And there's an obvious correlation. If you look at the red, that is galvanized. So obviously, as we've reduced the galvanized in the system, we have been able to reduce the main breaks in the system as well. So since the beginning of century two, uh, we did um, replace our pipe at an average of about 14 miles per year. And I'll, I'll call this our marathon pace. It's the pace that we believe in the long haul, that's the right pace for replacing our water pipe. Um, however, we have made some significant headway in where we are in our pipe success. Uh, we are at 64% newer pipe types, and we're getting ready to invest significantly in the water supply master plan. And so it's a balance between investing in the plants and the pipe. So since it's a marathon pace, you don't have to keep that pace all along. So here, what you don't see is outside of this long range plan, we expect to ramp back up uh, in our piping system as well. So speaking of the water supply master plan and investing in our plants, um, this is the status of our water supply master plan. Um, you've seen this before, and I'll touch on that. The green are projects that have been completed, the blue are in the future, and the red is our filters project. It is a nearly $60 million project to begin this fiscal year. Um, Shane Bragg, our water systems in, um, engineering manager, talked to you all uh, two months ago at a board meeting, and in result, uh, I'm not going to bore you with all the details of that project again. Uh, however, I did want to remind you it's a huge part of our plan, is $60 million. Likewise, uh, we're going to continue to eliminate, work towards elimination, and completely eliminate galvanized out of our system. Um, as well, we're going to continue to try to use the best analytics possible to best uh, invest our $96 million in long-range plan for pipe replacements. So I did mention earlier that water quality was paramount for our water system, um, and KUB employees have just simply maintained that focus. Um, as you can see, we have been uh, recognized in the industry for best practices. Um, TDEC, in their last inspection, we were just 0.2 percent away from a perfect score. Um, and then our water, water quality lab as well, they've been certified for more tests than any other public water system in the state, and they have gotten perfect scores their last two um, evaluations. I'll, I'll add that they were, when um, Ms. Bieras was on her tour, um, we had a inspection going on and we haven't heard the results of that one yet. Derwin, I, I really, I'm glad you're, you're ending water on, on this slide because, you know, as I think about, particularly as I think about Flint and I have some folks who are connected to, to that community, you know, we, out of all of our utilities, like we produce in, in the waste, in the water division, a consumable product, right, that people consume. And I think it's important that as much as we talk about, you know, infrastructure and things like that, that we really focus in on the quality of what we are giving to members of our community that many will consume them, many will use them in other ways. And so I think it's really, really important that we, we continually focus on, on water quality as much as we do kind of infrastructure type things. And, and I'm, I'm, so I'm glad you, you ended on that because that's, that's really important and that's always something I think for us to remember. And I don't think that prior to really understanding that, that we do produce a product that, that people consume and that and, and, and so health and safety has got to be of most important to us in that in that realm. So at, at our last uh, com, uh, community advisory panel meeting this, this couple weeks ago that was actually meant, asked about our water quality and so we actually submitted an email to those folks yesterday I think Elba about our water quality and report and how good our water is and how, how you know, fortunate we are and how we do a lot to make sure it stays that way. And so that is, a, that is a very relevant topic, and I appreciate you mentioning that. We probably need to do more there also to publicize that. So thanks. Uh, Question. Uh, yep. And this, since it's a workshop, I can ask silly questions. Uh, that's right. <laughs> um, water uh, taste. You know, you've got water quality, and then you've got the desirability from a taste standpoint they're two kind of separate things and my sister lives in Manhattan she's always bragging about how 
New York water comes in number one or something in, in taste. And I know for my own kids, um, I don't want them drinking juice and sodas and all this other stuff. I want, them, I want them to drink water. I know we have great water, and I know that some of that is, a fact, some of that is factored in by pipes in your home and the pipes leading up to your home. And so there are a lot of factors that lead to that. Um, but somehow, I mean, there are communities that have this really amazing tasting water uh, and I don't know how do we do we how do we measure that? Is that a priority? Is that something to uh, just if you'd speak uh, to that? that? That's a great question. I, I don't know that we've ever compared our taste necessarily um, on a on a annual you know anywhere against anyone. We work on taste and odor. Uh, we have chemicals that we can use that are safe uh, that we use to manage taste and odor. Um, probably what most people taste when it gets to their, to their home, has the chlorine would be my, you know, a, a little bit of a chlorine flavor-ish to it. Um, that's there for a reason. Well, just get rid of it. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So it's honestly there for a reason. <laughs> I'm a water quality person back here can answer probably more than anything. Um, yeah, it's, it's funny. Uh, the only time I was ever on the uh, front page of the News Sentinel, I was doing a taste and odor test back in the 1980s when I worked in the lab with my nose stuck in a bottle. Uh, what, they, what, what was going on back then was, uh, uh, since we are served by the, the lakes uh, upstream from us in the Tennessee River, uh, seasonally the, the water turns over. What was on the bottom moves up towards the top and all the algae and this type of thing uh, can affect the, the taste of our water. So we periodically run into that, but as Derwin said, we add the chemicals to, uh, to adjust that. And, and it is uh, primarily the, the, the chlorine uh, taste and odor. What we uh, often recommend to people who are bothered by that is if you'll just you know, put a bottle in the refrigerator un uncapped, uh, the, the chlorine will itself dissipate. It's a gaseous uh, uh, chemical and it will dissipate and, and leave over time and you can have the, the chlorine free taste out of, uh, out of tap water in that situation. Uh, I would so, submit as well that so, if you did that and you taste it against a bottled water, I don't know that you're going to taste much of a difference personally right. if you were to do that. So, in the, I'm sorry. No, well, I was going to say, so as, as Commissioner asked you and I were talking, so when we talk about chlorine, how many parts chlorine versus how many parts bourbon are we putting into our water? Yeah. <laughs> I just want to be sure. <laughs> we can talk about that later. Later, okay. <laughs> Was that not true? J Jerry said that. I just wanted to know. I, I, will, I will say, though, and I'm just well, anecdotally, I don't get any complaints at all on a water taste. I mean, I just don't hear that. I mean, I've been to other parts of the country where it's really bad. And, but we don't get any phone calls saying our water tastes funny. I really don't hear that. So anecdotally, I feel good about it. Right. I think it tastes great, but I'm biased. But I don't get, we don't get any calls from the call center saying, you know, the smell of taste, anything like that. So we're real careful about that. Right. Something that would um, impact the taste, and I and I know exactly what you're speaking to, right. uh, John. And it's and you're right, putting some ice in it, or mm -hmm. letting it breathe, so to speak, yes. sort of like a good wine. Yes. Um, <laughs> then you then it it's you, you can't taste it, but that's just you know some people have a little more sensitive sensitivity sure. to it. Sure. Mm -hmm. um, but is that something that would impact that? Actually, what we'll be doing is, is in essence, it's still, still chlorine, and mm -hmm. we still need a what we call a chlorine residual mm -hmm. at the tap. If you don't have that, it's not safe. I got you. And so we need to maintain, and we try to maintain that chlorine residual mm -hmm. um, at the house. Well, I, um, I would prefer that. So it, not only at the plant, <laughs> we have to put enough of some the appropriate amount of chlorine in there so that when it gets to your tap, mm -hmm. it does have some chlorine. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, going back to the disinfection methods, we'll just be basically using a different type of chlorine, in I essence. It won't be gaseous chlorine. It will be another different form type. of chlorine, per se, mm -hmm. to, in order to get that residual at your house. Okay. okay. That's the end. That's the end. Thank you. I'm going to close out today's presentation with the fun part. Uh, 
um, we'll give uh, a brief update on our long-range on our long-range financial plans for each system. I uh, will give an overview of the proposed budget for next fiscal year for FY22. We'll also talk about the funding of the budget. And as you know, part of the funding of the budget is the proposed 2% water rate increase. So we'll talk about that in a little bit more detail. Um, some of this we've already touched upon in, in various segments of today's presentation. Just I think it is important to note from the financial perspective that our financial plans continue to support and fund Century 2 O&M and Capital Infrastructure Programs, our Water Plant Resiliency Initiative, and you know, many other initiatives as well, but including our sustainability uh, programs and initiatives, which includes continued funding for home weatherization and our water efficiency slash toilet replacement program for our lower income customers. Uh, the community solar project that, that John referenced a, a few minutes ago. And then also the, the Green Invest program, that the 502 megawatts that will begin to come online actually in FY23 and then finish in FY24. So that's about $2 million per year once all of that does come online. And uh, there, there are quite a bit of capital project deferrals that go back to this current fiscal year, some in next fiscal year, most notably in the water and wastewater systems. Uh, which really allowed us to not have any rate increases uh, the current fiscal year and to eliminate and reduce rate increases in the upcoming fiscal year and obviously the, the bond refinancing savings played a role in that as well. We've already mentioned that we're really on track and even ahead of schedule to meet our wastewater debt reduction goals. Um, but when we talk about the gas division, and we'll have a chart on this here in a few moments, we are modifying our long-term funding approach for gas system capital a bit to be less reliant on debt. In fact, you'll see that we have very little debt in our long-range plan for gas that is intentional to bring down the outstanding debt. So why are we doing that? And I think everybody's heard there's, I would say, maybe characterize it as a bit of uncertainty in the long-term future of the natural gas industry. There are certain cities, municipalities, most notably on the West Coast, that have actually adopted ordinances that preclude any additional natural go gas growth in their areas. Whether that'll make its way uh, eventually to the eastern side of the, the country um, remains to be seen. But I think from a fiscal approach, given that we have a lot of financial flexibility in the gas division, we don't have a lot of rate increases at all. If we can you know, lower the debt, still invest in our capital as needed, I think that is a prudent thing to, to do that. So, and we've already talked about the enhanced grid mod program for electric that we discussed in detail last month is not reflected in what we're going to see today in the electric budget or the electric long range plan. And the proposed budget for FY22 totals $934 million. That is down 3% or about $28 million from the current year budget. And we'll look at that in more detail here in a few minutes. So just highlighting some of the noteworthy changes in, in these plans. We did have close to $60 million in capital project deferrals. Those, those projects are still in the plan. They've just been moved out a few years, again, to give us some flexibility with respect to rate increases. Uh, we talked about the significant debt reduction as a result of the refinancing. That is a noteworthy change to the plan that just occurred here in the last month or so. Um, as far as some cost additions, revenue subtractions, I did want to mention a, a few of those. Uh, we are investing more in vegetation management. John touched upon that, um, about $3 million per year, on, sort of on average. $27 million total being added to the electric long range plan for increased circuit trimming, some strategic tree removal ahead of electric system capital projects as well. Um, on interest income, it is down about 16 million from last year's plan. Interest rates have plummeted. That impacts how we can invest. We're very restricted by state law what we can invest our, our funds in anyway, but uh, those short-term interest rates are, as you know, very, very low. So we reduced our investment income 16 million out of this year's long range plan for all four systems combined. And then you will recall during the pandemic, uh, there was a number of customer related fees that we waived or suspended for a period of time. Uh, two of those were uh, payment transaction fees for credit, customers that pay with credit cards. Uh, we, we waived that, suspended that. And then also the door hanger fees for customers behind in their bills, given notice that they might be shut off. Obviously we suspended disconnects for a long time. Um, but both of those uh, we are not bringing back. We have permanently eliminated 
the payment transaction fees on credit cards, and we have permanently eliminated the door hanger fees, that $8 charge associated with that. All told, that took $10 million out of revenue, most notably the electric system. So just make you aware of that and the impact. Um, our electric plan does fully reflect this year the TVA partnership credit, and that is the 3.1% discount we get from ha having signed the, the long-term part long-term agreement with TVA, and that's about $9.5 million per year, okay? Two million of that is allocated to Green Invest Solar Purchases, which begin in FY23. One million is for home weatherization, and the rest we plugged into our electric plan. It actually allowed us to push back. We had six 1% rate increases for electric that began in FY23, went through FY28, we just shifted them all back one year. So now it's FY24 to FY29. That's really, you'd say, where the balance of those funds went once you plug it into to the electric plant. And then we did eliminate the electric wastewater rate increase for FY22. Um, we reduced it as a result of some project deferrals. The refinancing allowed us to just eliminate it altogether. And then the water rate increase um, has been reduced for really those same reasons from 5% to 2%. We looked hard to see if we could do without it. It simply begins to put a lot of things, I'll say, in jeopardy, but it impacts your century too. It impacts your water plant resiliency because if you took it completely out of the plan, then you're losing over $20 million. So it, it, is, it is, we really believe it is needed. So our rate recommendations for the upcoming fiscal year, no natural gas rate increase, that was expected. No wastewater rate increase, you know, we've just here in the last few weeks been able to basically eliminate that. Um, the water rate increase is 2%, reduced from 5%. And then the electric rate actions, and again, this is contingent upon what we're going to do with respect to the enhanced grid mod and broadband on that. If, we're, if it ends up not happening, then there is no electric rate increase in FY22. If it does happen, there's probably going to be one on the tail end of FY22 in April or so. I know we'll have more conversations on that as, as the months go by. So more detail about the water rate increase. It is proposed at 2% reduced from 5%. So what does that mean for our customers? For the average residential customer that uses about 3,700 gallons of water per month, it's an increase of 65 cents on the monthly bill. And this is being applied solely to the water commodity rate, not to that basic service charge. And as you well know, we've frozen the level of all basic service charges through December of, of 25. So this is based upon what you use. So, you know, average is, the average is 3,700 gallons of water per month, a little over that, 3,740 to be exact. But so if I use 1,500 gallons of water per month, and we have a lot of customers down in that range as well, my increase is 20 cents on the monthly bill. If I use 3,000 gallons per month, then it's going to be 50 cents. If I use more than 3740, then it's going to be more than the 65 cents. It's truly a function of how much you use. And for that, really, that same rationale as far as the, the dollar impacts on our business customers, it just is going to be based upon what they, what they use. Should be in that 2% range, but dollar impacts will, will, will vary depending on that. So as far as an effective date, we are recommending that the 2% the increase go into effect in July of this year and that would be reflected on customers' bills in August of this year. And commissioners, we, I th a few years ago, uh, you'll note that, uh, you'll recall, we uh, performed cost of service studies for each of our systems, and really our commitment has been that if we ever bring a rate increase recommendation to the board, we update our cost of service study just for, you know, if you have that information um, at your disposal. So we have recently updated our water cost of service study. Um, we performed one back in 2019, so we used the same uh, renowned consultant to, to update it here in 2021. And I'll point, I'll say that the results really haven't changed that much as you probably would expect over a period of two years. But I draw your attention to the far right column and you can see that basically what we're saying here for our residential customer class that we are under collecting um, in our, our, with our revenue of about 20% on that, about $5.1 million. According to cost of service, we should get $29.6 million from residential. We're getting 
projected to get 24.5. So that has to be made up somewhere else. And of course, it's the next line item. It is our non-residential or business customers that are essentially making up that difference, that 5.1 million difference. I'm sorry, I have a question. Um, why are we under collecting? What, what's the reason? Well, that's just the way the rates are structured. And that and what we're charging residential cost of service says you need to raise your rates for residential and lower your rates for business customers. Now I'll point out this is not unique to KUB. This is not unique for water utilities. It's not unique for any utilities. There is typically um, a uh, that the business customers help subsidize residential customers. And if we showed you all of our cost of service results from 2019 on electric, gas, and wastewater, you're going to see the same thing. Actually, not to this, this is probably the largest percentage differential that we have, um, but they all are going to show some level of, of subsidy for that. And um, so we are not, as part of this 2% increase, recommending that we close that gap at, at all. Um, it's just 2% across the board is what we're looking at. But this is for your information. And again, when we showed this in 2019, it was about the same thing. I think it's important for everybody to, if, if you do have difficulty uh, kind of understanding the idea of cost of service, please reach out to, to Gabe and Mark uh, because this comes up particularly in the electric, uh, yes. in, in, in the electric service. It, it's become quite political and the fact that we are, uh, we can justify, <laughs> we could justify much higher rate increases uh, than we, than we impose on our, our residential, residential customers. customers. That is correct. Cost of service also updates what our basic service charge calculation is, and it has several components to it. You can see those on the top hand, uh, top part of the, the slide here. But it is saying that the basic service charge, according to cost of service, should be $18.77 per month. We currently charge $18, and we'll stay at that level at least through December of 2025. But uh, that is about 4% or 77 cents below um, uh, what cost of service says. So again, just for your information, obviously the 2% is not going to impact that $18 at all. And then to just give you a sense of how our water rates compare to those around us, the surrounding utility districts, this is a residential bill based upon that 3,740 3, gallons of, of monthly water use. And you can see we're currently middle of the pack at $27.95. Um, and then we're going to be increasing that 65 cents to $28.60. So we'll remain somewhat middle of the pack, pretty close to Northeast Knox and West Knox Utility, and then well below what Knox Chapman and Hallsdale Powell would charge for that equivalent usage. Okay. Okay, so now we're going to transition and look at the system long range financial plans. And these next four charts, I know Celeste will really appreciate, um, but they, because they do have a, a host of numbers in them. Um, and I'll try and be relatively, just hit the high points of this, but this is straight out of our plans. Uh, well, we'll begin with, with water. Um, the far left column outside of the year is the capital. And so we have about $363 million in total capital for the water system over the next 10 years. So that's an average of about 36 million per year. We're a little bit low on that below average in the upcoming fiscal year budget, and that is because some of those project deferrals that we have done to help with the, the rate increases. No bonds are expected to be needed in FY22, but for the 10 years in total, um, that adds up to $119 million in new water debt. The actual net increase in the outstanding bonds, there is a net increase in outstanding bonds for water. There's a number you don't see on here that I think is like $199 million. There's going to be a net increase of $24 million. So we're going to issue $119 million new debt over the next 10 years. We'll pay off $95 million. The delta is a plus $24 million on that. And our debt ratio? Um, it's going to be relatively stable, mid-40s, and then begin to decline. And you'll, you can see lightly there that I've put a green circle around 2030. We do have a goal to get that below 40 percent by 2030. The debt coverages are going to steadily improve. That's good because our target is two times on maximum debt service. You see the rate increase of 2 percent. 
And then after that, you see nothing but every year it's 6% increase. So if we were looking at this, you know, a year, year and a half ago, those were all 5% increases. In fact, we had a 5% increase for FY21, 5% for FY22, and then all the way down through. We didn't have any increase in FY21. We were reducing to 2% in FY22, but that has an effect of raising those outer increases a little bit. So they have all moved to 6%. Uh, so just to make you aware of that. And again, this is all part of the balanced funding plan. It has Century 2, water plant resiliency to be funded in that as well. So just so you're aware of where we may be going in the future with respect to rates. So on wastewater, 10-year um, capital programs, about $390 million, $39 million per year. It's a little bit higher in 2022. Jones Street Pump Station, we have $9 in the budget, $9 million. I wish we had $9. Um, $9 million in the, in the budget for that. And then you have some of the final payments on the BHRC as well. So it's a little bit higher than the average next year. On the bonds, we are uh, proposing a $12 million bond issue to help fund that capital budget in FY. 22. Total debt to be issued over the 10 years is uh, 113 million, and we're actually going to have a big net decrease. Um, again, I think I'm not to keep harping on this, but that number would be like 520 something million um, if we had, didn't have the refinancing. So we've already dropped it down, and we're going to drop it down. We'll end the plan at 427 million dollars. So you see this first green circle here that around the 425 million. Our goal was for that to be below 450 by 2030. You can now see we're achieving that by 2025. So well ahead of schedule on that. Um, this was the goal we set back in 2017 to have this below 50% by 10 years out in 27. We're on track to achieve that, in fact, a year in advance on that. Debt coverages are strong. They trend down a little bit in the outer years because the rate increases get smaller. So no rate increase this year, but we're looking out for the next three years for that to be around 4% per year. Okay. Gas. A, a lower level capital program, 260 million over 10 years. That's about 26 million per year. It's a little bit above average in FY22. The next column is really the one to draw your attention to. There's virtually no debt. In the plan. There's a single $8 million bond issue in FY23, and that is it. Um, as a result, the outstanding level of gas debt is going to plummet. It'll be $34 million by the end of the plan. And you can see the debt coverages, they really begin to skyrocket, which is a good thing uh, in, in, in this world. Um, and that the higher your debt service coverage, the better it is. And so it gets up over six, which is a number I never thought I'd ever see in my lifetime or career. Um, rate increases, no rate increase in FY22 or for the next three fiscal years. In order to remove some of the debt that was here, we bumped those up from 1% per year to 2%. Of course, that's several years out. We'll have many more discussions about this before we come to any decision point on that. And then finally, electric. Again, just to, to, to let you know, there's obviously none of that enhanced grid mod, $700 million in this. The, $714 million total capital plan, $73 million in the upcoming budget year. We are proposing a $16 million bond issue for the electric division for next fiscal year, though that official action on that will not occur next month. We're going to defer that until the fall, until that whole process decision making on broadband plays out. Because if we do go forward with broadband and the enhanced grid mod program, that's going to be like an $80 million bond issue. So more to come on that. A level of debt relatively stable increases a bit. It ends at $288 million. Debt ratio does decline, be around 30% by the end of the plan. Solid debt coverages. And here are the rate increases, none this year, none next year. In last year's plan, this was 1%, and it ended here. We just shifted it all down or out one year. And that's a lot of numbers, but um, I know that you all like that stuff. Um, quick, quick question, Mark. Yes. Uh, on the long-range plan, I keep getting reports that, um, you know, be prepared for uh, inflation uh, mm -hmm. projections to, yes. to change. How do we, uh, you know, obviously if you've got a 
you know, got a capital cost in 2026 of 40 mm -hmm. million dollars. Uh, that that could be, who knows, yeah. what. Uh, well, do we, we do. have? I guess my uh, underlying question is: Do we have an inflation? Uh, we do. Do we, do we match? We match up inflation with kind of. We have inflation projections. We have inflation projections for every year in the plan. Okay. Um, you know, two and a half, three percent. I think it's about two point six percent in in total. So if it goes that. to four, we'll just have to, to plan four, We have to adjust. Yeah. Yep. Thank you. Okay, last segment of the presentation, the proposed budget. I'll try and go through this fairly quickly. Again, it's $934 million total. As you know, each system has its own budget appropriation, so you can see what those various amounts are. Electric 596, gas 131, water 79, wastewater 128. By major cost component, you know, energy is usually what we purchase from TVA, what we purchase from gas suppliers. That is you know, almost 50% of the total proposed budget. O&M is going to be 167 million, capital 178 million, the debt service, principal and interest payments on outstanding bonds, 84 million, and in lieu of tax payments and federal payroll taxes combined, 42 million for a total of 934. How does that compare to our current fiscal year budget? It is down about 28 and a half million dollars. That's three percent. Uh, the major variance is really on the capital line item. As you can see, it's down almost 34 million dollars. Part of that is those project deferrals we've talked about. Also the BHRC project, Kauai, a lot of dollars spent on that in FY21, not so much in FY22. O&M is up $9 million. Um, that is labor related, it's about two thirds of that. There is a modest wage growth of about two and a half percent built into the plan. And then we do have some additional staffing positions, a little bit higher contributions for our pension and OPEB trust funds as required by our actuary on that. So debt service is down, that's your refunding savings, that small portion of that for FY22. Key programs and projects, we've already really talked about all of this. Um, this are just some of the, the, the big dollar projects that are reflected in the FY22 budget. So the vegetation management, about $13 million total. Water filter project, Jones Street pump station, those are all multi-year projects, so you see those amounts. I do want to mention quickly the sustainability initiatives. We have $4.7 million in the FY22 budget, so what is that? A million dollars for home weatherization, roughly a million dollars for our water efficiency toilet replacement program, because we didn't spend that much this year, so we're still going to use the funds. We just roll it in to the FY22 budget. And one thing on that, I know as we started out, just quickly for your information, that's okay, that's a toilet replacement program and it can maybe do some other things as well. We are now looking to expand the scope of that. A lot of homes that we've gone into, even those we've, we've been able to go into in the pandemic, the, they often have new toilets. So it's like, well, okay. Um, but we're looking to expand that. We may need to replace the water line in the yard. There may be other things that we can do to make that home more efficient with respect to water and obviously sewer, what's going into the sewer as well. So we're looking to expand the scope of that. And then of course, community solar project is one and a half million in FY22 as well. Funding of the budget, 934 million total. The pie chart on the left, you've really already seen, it's just a different form, all the cost components. How will the budget be funded? As typical, usually about over 90% of it is from utility system revenues, so that's 865 million. $28 million in new bonds, 16 million electric, 12 million wastewater. And then we have about $40 million in general fund cash on hand that we'll use to, to help fund the budget as well. Which takes us, last slide. Um, to looking forward to next month. And we will have several resolutions, official action items related to, to the budget and funding of the budget. Obviously the budget appropriations itself for all four systems. Commitment appropriations. Um, and that is where we need an appropriation from the board to be that if we enter into contracts or other agreements that commit KUB to expenditures beyond FY22. That's what that's all about. And then the $12 million wastewater bond issue uh, we are deferring action again on the 16 million electric bond issue until later in the year. And then uh, the 2% water rate increase. So that's first reading. As you know, there's two readings on rate increases. If approved next month, we'll bring it back in June for second reading. And then it would go into effect in July and be reflected on customer bills in August. And that is all I have. I've got a question about our revenues. Um, I know you've got a projection for FY22 of Yes, but how is 
the FY21 revenue matching up to what uh, you had budgeted? Um, it is down. Um, I don't have it right here in front of me. That's um, a good question, but it is well, well below budget. Um, in part because um, energy costs are down quite a bit, so you just, just flow through. Uh, that's a big component of it, um, but also because of the pandemic. And um, from a, you know, a cash revenue perspective, there's since we you know, suspended disconnections and, and all of that, then I think the total pandemic impact on revenue is just right around $20 million for FY21. Uh, we're going to get some of that back within FY21. On a lot of it's 13 million of that we've designated as timing, okay, um, and uh, eventually we'll, we're projecting to come back to us either by the end of this fiscal year or into next fiscal year. So really, the net loss on that's about seven million dollars on that. And one thing that's been a big help we've talked about this before is all the utility bill assistance that is out there. Uh, we designated all that pandemic relief credit from TVA 7.3 million and that goes for really goes for all systems um, all that's going to come back to us um, and then there's uh, LIHEAP project help and you know this new funding that the city and county are getting from the federal government for utility bill and rental assistance you know, I think it's like 14 million dollars in the first year alone so you know and a lot of that is coming back to us but there is some net loss on that it's probably around seven to eight million dollars question hope that answers your question. yes I do want to close uh, first of all thanking you all for all the questions you ask and very engaging I really appreciate that uh, there, there are no dumb or silly questions I promise you and never will be uh, I do want to thank some folks who put this together this is a production that our folks really get, get are good at but they do a lot of behind the scenes work to make us look even better so I want to recognize Chris Hood your controller and his folks Brian Day he's back there with the black mask on uh, Brandon Gibson, Melissa Reynolds, Rick Jackson are the, really our budget folks that put to get these numbers together. On the communications side, Darren Rines. Yeah, Darren's in the back there. Um, Jay Miller's right behind me on the camera. Uh, Court Courtney Roark, uh, Stephanie Midget, Kelly Hamblin, Chris Tyler in the print shop do a great job. What you, a person you don't see who sets up all this technology is Jeff Lowe. He hides in the room behind me, but is all this interactive cameras and microphones. He does a phenomenal job keeping us... Uh, streaming live and, and, and very active. And then finally, but not last but not least, Debbie Hullett, who he keeps us all straight downtown, runs the show uh, for us down there and, and really puts us all together and makes it seem very seamless. So thank you to those folks for your efforts. It's not an easy effort. You all make it seem easy, but I know it's a lot of work behind the scenes. So thank you very much. Uh, yes. And that concludes my comments. Uh, anything else, uh, turn it back over to the chair. I have one. If you haven't looked at the Austin East um, teen work video that's up on the KUV website, please do. It's a it's a remarkable group of young people, and um, we um, I'm I'm very pleased that our teen work program um, has plugged into that. That's great. Thank you for that reminder, Commissioner. Go ahead. Were you going to make a comment? Mm -hmm. I was going to adjourn. Uh, I was just going to say very, very quickly when you mentioned um, teen work is, you know, a lot of our <clears throat> students who have been working with you all and who have been supporting you all um, through the program are, are suffering. Many of them are hurt. They're suffering right now. So if you do have any relationships with some of the young people that you have worked with through teen work, certainly reach out to them. Um, you know, give them a call, just shoot them a message and let them know that you're there in your thoughts and prayers. And again, as an organization, you know, I saw the message on social media uh, the other day, but just continually support our Austin East, our Knoxville, uh, and our East Knoxville community. Um, that's important to do as we move through these very, very difficult, very, very challenging times. Um, and so just, just whatever you can do to support your colleagues, your friends, um, the young people that you know in the community, um, now's the time to do it because they need all of us uh, joining together to to help them through this, so just just do what we can do um, to support to, to support our community. Well, I would I would point out uh, too, following up on that, that the discussions we're having about broadband 
at this point could not be more timely or more important. It's so rare that we actually have the opportunity to consider something that's systemic. Uh, we spend so much time, all of us who have big hearts and, and, and big compassion, uh, we spend time trying to help fix a problem, but we end up doing it one person at a time, one meal at a time, one weatherization at a time. And uh, the, the opportunity, we haven't decided whether we're going to do it or not, but the opportunity to, to really be able to look deeply into a systemic issue that will have a direct positive impact if we can afford it, and if it seems the wise thing to do, it have a direct impact on a whole system of people who have been neglected. Uh, and I think that's a, that's a great gift for us to have that opportunity to consider it. And it, the timing couldn't be better. So thank you for that, Tavi. Um, following adjournment of this meeting, the board will have a lunch session that is open for the public to observe. This meeting is adjourned. <laughs>